Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the August edition of the Nehru Electric Vehicle State Working Group. Um, we can uh, move on to our, our first slide of content here and I can talk through the agenda. Um, today, we'll be talking uh, about air regulations. So um, let's just pull up the title for today's. Um, so we've got some really good uh, uh, presenters from the EPA, from the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management, and then also from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so I'll introduce each one of our speakers as as we uh, as, as they come up. But first, we've got just a couple announcements. So um, if we go on to the next slide, so we have a EV charging infrastructure conference and the fourth roadmap conference. These are two different conferences that are uh, kind of being hosted simultaneously and in conjunction. Uh, they're both in Detroit, which is my hometown where I'm based. So uh, I'm hoping that some of you will be able to come and join me um, here. And I'll have the opportunity to, uh, to show you around. Um, these are being hosted on September 23rd and 24th for the NASIO ashto uh, joint office, EV Charging Infrastructure National Conference. And then just after that is the fourth roadmap uh, conference, the, the following couple of days, same location. Uh, and it looks like uh, Danielle was able to secure some funding, some uh, uh, stipends, travel stipends for EV state working group members if you'd like to attend that. So, uh, if you would like to explore that idea of a travel stipend or discount and to attend this conference, you can email Robert there and he'll get you some more information. And it looks like um, uh, Danielle is putting some information in the chat about, about the conference. Um, and we will talk more about dates later, but we're planning on a that, that one overlaps with our planned September uh, EV State Working Group calls, so we're planning on pushing that back by one week to October 1st, but we'll uh, we'll talk more about that at the end. Um, okay, I think we're good. Danielle, anything else? And Want to add anything to that? No? Okay, great. Okay, so today we'll be talking about uh, air quality and the and utility regulator collaboration and the effects that these air quality regulations have had on electric vehicles and um, on on the states that have implemented them. Uh, so, like I mentioned, we've got a, a three guest speakers with us today, and the same uh, style of meeting that we have had um, for the last couple of years. So, we'll start off with these three guest speakers. We're going to hold Q&A until the end of each of the three speakers' presentations, do all of our Q&A all at once. All speakers will come back on camera and be there to, uh, to answer your questions. You can either hold your questions for the end and ask them live if you would like, or you can enter them into the chat as they come up, uh, and we can, we can just um, read them out loud as, as we get to that Q&A period, or the speakers can just answer them in the chat in real time, whichever works better for you. Um, and then after the end of our Q&A period, we're going to reserve those last, uh, I think we have 30 minutes today, 25 minutes. We let our last 25 minutes today for our peer sharing and discussion where we can talk about our experiences in each of our individual states. And that's the closed session, non-recorded, where it's just the opportunity for commissioners and commission staff to have that state to state dialogue um, and have that those open conversations about what we're seeing and experiencing and ask each other questions and provide experience and advice. Okay, let's get into it. Next slide. So I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker now from the uh, US EPA. One second, we have Zoltan Jung. He is the uh, quote unquote electric power sector guy at the US EPA's Office of Transportation and Air Quality. 
where for 18 years, he has supported electric vehicle and electric power sector aspects of several prominent mobile source rulemakings, including the first ever national greenhouse gas emission standards in 2010, as well as the recent light and medium duty vehicle rule, which was finalized earlier this year. So with that, I'd like to invite Zoltan to take over and uh, give us your presentation, Zoltan. Uh, oh, sorry about that. I started my talk and didn't realize I was muted. Can you hear me, Commissioner Paratech? Sure can. Great, great. Uh, thank you very much for that very gracious introduction. Uh, uh, let's see. Will Robert be advancing my slides? He will, great. yes. Great. You'll just have to note, note when you'd like him to advance. And uh, we can hear you, but we can't see you. I don't know if you've turned your camera on or not. Uh, Mom, let me see if I can figure out how to make that work. Uh, let me work on that one. I have a government issued computer, which doesn't work very well. So anyways, we'll get on to this with the slides. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, Zoltan Jung. I work at the Office of Transportation and Air Quality here in lovely Ann Arbor, Michigan, a place that USA Today often refers to as our secret laboratory for setting uh, mileage ratings. Uh, um, I mean, like Samsung, that's kind of like a oh, Okay. And uh, anyways, so while our laboratory uh, isn't all that secret, we do in fact regulate emissions from things that move. These are mobile sources. Uh, the rule there would be that if it's not bolted to the ground for more than six months out of the year and it emits something, it's considered a mobile source. This doesn't account for chickens and pigs and so forth, but it is does deal with aircraft and ships and locomotives and snowmobiles and cars and trucks. So basically those are mobile sources. Those are the things that we regulate here at the EPA. Uh, next slide, please. And we do this because the Clean Air Act tells us to. Uh, all of this started way back in 1965 with the Motor Vehicle Pollution Control Act. Uh, parts of that were incorporated into the original Clean Air Act of 1970. And from that original Clean Air Act and all of its subsequent amendments, uh, the National Vehicle Fuel Emissions Laboratory was created. That's where I work at here in Ann Arbor. Uh, we could see here on the right a very young Chris Christopherson looking individual uh, taking a look at a, a very early Ford product. Uh, next slide, please. In order to do this, in order to set these standards accurately, we need to have a very strong understanding of what the auto industry is doing. And we gain this industry from a handful of ways I'll explain why all this is important to this particular rule. But one of the ways that auto companies tell us or signal to us what they envision doing down the road is, well, they, they basically tell us they, in order to sell a car in this country, you need a certificate of conformity, uh, whether you're a foreign manufacturer that wants to sell cars or a local manufacturer, domestic manufacturer, you need a certificate of conformity. And to get those, you send your vehicles to the US EPA, send those here so that we can test them. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is important because car companies would rather tell us what they're doing years in advance so that they're sure that they can sell their cars legally in this country as opposed to spending hundreds of millions of dollars on a vehicle platform and the subsequent factory only to find out that they can't legally be sold here. So we know what car companies are doing many years in advance. All this is very confidential. We cannot share it, but we can use this information in our rules to help us get a feel for what the car industry is doing and what can be done. And then the subsequent impacts on the electric power sector. Uh, we do that through uh, testing of vehicles uh, when they come off the assembly line. Our rules are unique in that we also have, uh, our rules are in-use rules or end-of-life rules. So the vehicles produced or sold in this country have to meet the emission standard at the end of their useful life. And we do this by uh, selectively picking up vehicles that are in use and testing them to see if they in fact meet the standard. This is one of the ways in which Volkswagen was caught a few years ago through this uh, ongoing surveillance testing that we do as normal, uh, 
because the Clean Air Act tells us to basically. Uh, next slide, please. And another important tool we have are vehicle teardowns. Um, the auto companies routinely purchase vehicles from the competitors and completely disassemble them to figure out how they built the car, what parts they used, how much the parts weigh, how they can find replacement or alternative parts. And we do precisely the same thing in our part of the EPA. We use the same contractors and the same firms to disassemble these vehicles. So we know we have a very good feel for what vehicles can do and how we can improve. Oh, actually, um, I'm off by a slide. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so uh, we are we know very much what these vehicles will do. No, no, you're fine. Uh, go back. This is that's perfect right there. And um, so we have these vehicle teardowns in the in the previous slide. You'll see one of these teardowns where the vehicles completely stripped down to individual parts. We incorporate all that information into various models that we use. And what we see on this slide that we're now looking at is um, uh, the national. Hold on a second. Um, we see our, our compliance models, the Omega compliance model that we use to set these standards. Information from there, which includes uh, expected vehicle fleet at the national level, vehicle miles trans, uh, traveled and the like, is incorporated into uh, our likely adopter model that our economists use here to figure out how these vehicles will be accepted or if they'll be accepted in various parts of the US. This information is handed off to our friends at the National Renewable Energy Lab, who use the EVA suite of tools to develop load shapes for these vehicles. These load shapes are particular to various regions um, that are consistent with NERC regions. This is in our uh, next stage to the left on the lower left-hand side in the integrated planning model. This is the same model that EPA uses for all of its uh, Section 111 stationary source work. So. Our model that we use is completely consistent with what the EPA has been using throughout. And then the outputs of that particular model then are incorporated back into the Omega model. And this is important because we, we need to close the loop. We need to see if what the effects of the power sector or on the power sector in terms of cost or availability and the like, to see if that affects the compliance strategy of the auto manufacturers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that the very first model we use, even before Omega, is uh, Alpha, which is uh, used to predict uh, CO2 emissions and energy consumption from these vehicles. It characterizes the emissions from the vehicles based upon its footprint, its size, and the like. And it simultaneously balances the producer's requirements, their profit, the amount of greenhouse gas credits they have, all these things along with consumer expectations and then policy requirements, whether they're state or local. And it does all this, it balances these things in a way to produce the least expected or least expensive vehicle. Uh, next slide, please. That data feeds into the Omega model, which I referred to earlier. This is a compliance model that looks for cost-effective pathways to incorporate all of that information from all those teardowns and all that testing and all this confidential information that the car companies provide for us, we incorporate that into this model to come up with what we believe to be the cost-effective way of getting to that end point. Uh, next slide, please. I think what's an important point I want to underscore here is the value of a compliance model. Uh, what we've been seeing is that a lot of models or a lot of estimates for electric vehicle uh, fleets in the future neglect this compliance component. So they might produce a fleet that can be justified financially or technologically, but at the end of the day, they might not be, and typically are not legal and would not be fleets that car companies would produce unless they wanna pay hundreds of millions of dollars in fines. So that's an important point to keep in mind for uh, the users of this. You know, be, be advised that not, for our role or not for our model, but other models, you might find that they produce fleets that are not necessarily compliant. EIA's NEMS model is a lot like that. It produces vehicle fleets that make sense economically, but couldn't legally be created. Uh, next slide, please. This is a brief, 
brief walkthrough of what NREL's EVI tools use. These are very helpful tools we make quite some use of. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have the inputs. These come from the alpha model and the omega model. Uh, on the right-hand side, what we see is the output, the composite hourly demand. On the next slide, we can see outputs from the model. And what we find is that the demand charge and the increases in demand charge associated with our rule are pretty much what you'd expect them to be. You know, if the population increases in an area, well, there's going to be a proportionate number of increases in demand charge associated with the vehicles that people purchase in those areas. And we also see here the effects of just state and local rules. You know, state, if California, for instance, is really big into EVs, we see a greater penetration of vehicles there as a result of that. Uh, next slide, please. And all this comes by way of our integrated planning model, uh, IPM. This is our uh, economic dispatch model that the Section 111 folks in the stationary source part of the EPA use for all their rulemaking purposes. Our, our inputs are identical, the model is identical, the assumptions are identical, the staff is identical. Everything we do with our results that come from the electric vehicle fleet is um, uh, is consistent with, with what the agency does otherwise. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> we can see uh, our expected power sector demand and generation uh, down the road. Uh, here we have uh, the, our modeling run results for 2018 to 2050, uh, 2028 to 2050, and they're broken down into two sets of groups. Uh, the gray columns are the no action cases. These are instances where our our rule doesn't take effect. It just, you know, what would happen uh, as a business as usual case, this takes into consideration the effects of the bill in the IRA. The green columns are the final rulemaking results. This is what would happen if the rule that we propose is implemented. We can see in 2028, the increase in uh, charge demand is slight, less than a percent. Uh, it increases up to over 11%. In 2050, uh, we're, we're keeping a close eye on that, trying to get a better feel for how that might change in conjunction with uh, data centers or any other bolts out of the blue as well. But again, these are uh, manageable at this point. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the annual generation mix doesn't change or changes as we would expect it to. Again, we have couples of data here, uh, the no action and the final rulemaking cases for 2028 to 2050, as one would imagine, uh, coal decreases over that time due to its economical, its cost-related issues. We expect natural gas to decrease somewhat as well with increases in renewables and the like. Um, next slide, please. And again here, um, what we have are on the left-hand side, are the no action case. That's the case where we don't do anything for 2028 and 2050. And on the right hand side, we have the combined rulemaking effects, both for the heavy duty phase three rule, that's the truck rule, as well as the load associated with the light and medium duty vehicle rule, which is the rule that I worked primarily on. And the important take home here is that when you compare uh, maps on the left and the right in the same row, there's very little change between the two. They, uh, we don't expect there to be a significant change in the load in 2050, as well uh, as in 2028. You know, they're similar back and forth because you know, our, compared to other loads, we're not expecting significant impact. Next slide, please. And likewise, we see that with primary energy sources as well. Uh, again, the breakdown is no action on the left, action on the right for 2028 to 2050. When you make the crosswise horizontal comparison, you see that the country will look more or less the same when it comes to primary energy source in 2028 as it would without the rulemaking. That's also true for 2050 as well. Next slide. This is perhaps the most important slide of the deck. And that is perhaps a little counterintuitive. You know, We see that the emissions 
for greenhouse gases from electric power plants are slightly above what would be typically expected under the no action case. What's critical here is that there's an immense decrease in tailpipe and refinery emissions that completely and utterly swamps this slight increase in electric power plant emissions. So there's tremendous value gained elsewhere that's not represented here. And on the next slide, we see the same thing is true for NOx. You know, no big surprise, NOx increases somewhat because of the increased uh, electric demand due to vehicle electrification. But ultimately, it's, it's very, very small compared to the emissions that would have been there otherwise. Uh, next slide. Uh, likewise, we see the costs are not too significant in the future when we consider uh, a reasonably managed case. I'm not going to spend any time going over this because I'm at the end of my 15 minutes. And because, next slide, all of this was discussed way back in April when the Department of Energy came in to um, uh, give a talk on the transportation electrification impact study, a study that we worked very closely with the folks at DOE with to develop this. This is where we get a feel for the distribution level impacts and the costs associated with that and potentially ways to decrease uh, those costs down the road. Uh, I think what's been important here for me as a Fed, we um, the Feds aren't really used to uh, the world in which commissioners and commission staff function. I used to be commission staff back in Wisconsin many years ago in the electric division. And so I was excited about this project because it started to provide data or information on what might be used and useful, what would have been used and useful for me way back when I was doing commission related work and trying to get a feel for potential values associated with deferment of distribution or vehicle electrification or distributed energy resources. All these things are captured in this TEIS. I think at this point in time, uh, if you go forward just a couple of slides to the conclusion, we can go over this. This is all captured in the TEIS, which was delivered to you folks way back in April. If you have questions, I can get back to it. One more slide, please. Yeah, take home is that um, we're going to expand the TEIS to get a better feel for what happens at the state level as a result of our uh, electrification assumptions. We're uh, writing various papers to capture all these effects. Uh, we write papers so we can actually get the information out into the hands of the public in general. And on, on my final slide is my contact information. Uh, I will certainly be here. Next slide, please. And I will be here for um, uh, to answer questions, uh, I will make available this slide deck. I need to change it a little bit before I get it back to you. Here's my contact information. Uh, thank you very much for chatting or listening in. And, oh, I see the DOE folks are here. Ah, the, the very folks that were very instrumental in our work are also called in here. So anyways, thank you so much. I appreciate the time. And uh, back to you, Commissioner Paratek. Thank you, Zoltan. Really appreciate it. That was um, that was great. That's definitely a perspective that uh, that I don't think we've had at the um, our EV State Working Group before. Um, and I, yeah, that's right. I, I forgot that you're located in Ann Arbor. I said earlier on the call that I'm located in Detroit, but uh, much more accurately, I'm located exactly halfway between Detroit and Ann Arbor. So uh, that's where I'm sitting right now from my house. Um, so it's uh, great to great to have you on and, and to be um, to be a part of this. And thank you for offering to stick around into after the next two presentations to uh to offer uh to answer some q a so we'll uh oh your 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 uh, your video is working now we can see you now ah, thank you. Uh, right at the end yes <laughs> um so uh, uh thanks for thanks for sticking around i'm sure that that generated a lot of questions from the audience um but at this point we will we'll move on to our next present next presentation we have uh megan o'toole uh who is a Senior Policy Advisor with Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management Clean Transportation Team, where she supports states in adopting and implementing motor vehicle emission regulatory programs and transportation electrification programs. Prior to joining, Megan served as General Counsel for Vermont's Air Quality and Climate Division, as well as the Climate Change Mitigation Program Manager for Vermont's Climate Office. 
Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Megan for your presentation. Thank you so much, Commissioner Perichik, and thank you all for having me here today. Um, the focus of my presentation is going to be on, um, you know, kind of shedding some light on what air quality regulators, specifically mobile source practitioners and mobile source emission standard program administrators are up to um, in your jurisdictions and, um, you know, how their work um, in terms of adopting and implementing air quality regulations that um, require certain levels of stringency for zero emission vehicle sales in certain states can impact the work of um, regulated utilities and regulated utility commissions. Next slide, please. So for those of you that are not familiar with NESCOM, um, we have been around for, for quite a while um, and we, we focus regionally, but um, because of the work that we have been doing in the mobile sources regulatory space over the years, we actually facilitate working groups that go beyond um, our traditional region, which is all of the New England states plus New York and New Jersey. Um, so while this is the, the map of our, our membership, technically, um, we do work a lot with other states outside of our region. Um, but our mission is to provide scientific, technical, and policy support to um, air quality and climate uh, offices, divisions, programs within um, state environmental agencies. And so our board of directors is made up of the directors of all the air quality divisions in our member states. Um, but we also collaborate really closely, as I mentioned, with other states, including federal agencies, the in, um, industry partners, um, auto manufacturers, and other implementers of um, mobile source uh, regulatory programs. Um, we also facilitate our uh, mobile sources committee, which is made up of the states that have adopted uh, California's motor vehicle emission standard program, which I'll get into a bit more in my presentation. And then we also facilitate a multi-state zero emission vehicle task force. And we have uh, facilitated the development of a series of MOUs um, with our member states and beyond and other jurisdictions to set goals related to adoption and uptake of zero emission vehicles. Um, I'll just clarify too, before we move on, that NESCOM um, is really limited to providing support on the issues that I mentioned here. And we are we don't consider ourselves to be an advocate or an advocacy organization. Um, so we tend to just really stay within the realm of providing that type of support and facilitation to our member states and beyond. Next slide, please. So some key Clean Air Act provisions that I think will help set the baseline for the content of my presentation is to understand that um, the, the Clean Air Act preempts states from setting their own motor vehicle emission standards. So Section 209 of the Clean Air Act says um, you, you cannot be more stringent than the federal government's own motor vehicle emission standards. Um, however, there is an exception um, that is carved out in the Clean Air Act, specifically for the state of California. Um, and at the time of the Clean Air Act adoption, several decades ago, um, California's air quality was quite severely poor. And so it carved out the specific exemption for California to allow it to be more stringent um, in terms of motor vehicle emission standards than the EPA. Um, but whenever California does uh, adopt these standards, they then subsequently have to apply for a waiver of that preemption from EPA in order to enforce those regulatory standards in their jurisdiction. And then further, Section 177 of the Clean Air Act allows other states to follow California's lead so long as the regulations that they're adopting are identical to the state of California's program. Um, and this prevents what's called in the Clean Air Act as the third vehicle. So really there can only be two different vehicles certified to a particular standard um, in the United States. There's the California certification and then the federal certification issued by EPA. Um, and then the other detail is that whenever a state does adopt the, the California's programs, they have to give automakers at least a two-year model year head start um, before those uh, regulations are enforceable and, and implemented. Next slide, please. 
So what, what exactly are zero emission vehicle sales requirements? So this is a component of the regulatory programs that these air quality regulators adopt to help mitigate emissions from the transportation sector within their state. So as I mentioned, California and the Section 177 states can adopt these requirements that are meant to be really technology forcing regulations that require automakers to build cleaner uh, vehicles uh, across all of the weight classes. Um, it increases the percentage of zero emission vehicles that are delivered to each state by setting requirements that automakers deliver a certain percentage of zero emission vehicles, new, new vehicles, to each participating state every year, and that ramps up over time. So as I mentioned, automakers are really the regulated entities in this case. Um, and then um, beyond adoption of the regulations themselves, states implement complementary policies to help drive demand to meet the increasing supply of zero emission vehicles that the regulation guarantees. Next slide, please. There's many reasons why states would be motivated to adopt California's program and require more sales of zero emission vehicles. Obviously, first and foremost, in line with air quality programs missions is to improve air quality. Um, there's many components of um, mobile sources pollution that cause significant public health issues um, from uh, smog forming pollutants like nitrogen oxides and VOCs to particulate matter and um, toxic air pollution. Um, this also helps to address the um, kind of historical um, disproportionate impacts of air quality, especially where you have um, areas of heavy truck traffic co-located with environmental justice populations. Um, obviously, transportation has a huge impact on our changing climate as it is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. The regulations also help to create regulatory certainty, not only for the automotive industry, but also for fleets, utilities, um, state and local governments that operate large fleets so that they can effectively plan and appropriately manage their tr transition to zero emission vehicles and build appropriate infrastructure to support those vehicles. This also helps to um, generate economic growth as the vehicle fleet transitions, um, and then also enhances energy security and resilience by um, less reliance on uh, foreign fossil fuel supply. Next slide, please. So just a brief history of these programs, zero emission vehicle regulations were actually first adopted in um, the mid 80s and the percentage of zero emission vehicle sales um, has ramped up through various iterations of the program over the years. Um, Advanced Clean Cars was the precursor to Advanced Clean Cars 2, um, which was rolled out um, around 2016 and um, and kind of, as I said, increase the stringency of zero emission vehicle sales in the participating states. And then Advanced Clean Cars 2 was the most stringent version of this program, which requires 100% of new vehicles sold in participating states to be zero emission vehicles by the year 2035. And then ACT has similar ramps up in stringency, depending on the, um, the weight class of uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles um, and their ZEV sales percentage share. Um, currently, there are 17 states participating in Advanced Clean Cars 2. Um, and uh, as you can see in the, the bottom left corner here, um, the amount of zero emission vehicles that is delivered to these states um, far exceeds the amount of zero emission vehicles that are delivered to non-participating states, ensuring a, a greater supply of these vehicles um, in, in those states. Next slide, please. So while the state environmental agencies and more specifically the air quality programs and mobile source practitioners are the adopters of these regulations and typically have jurisdiction in state law to control emissions from mobile sources, 
There is a number of implementing partners that are incredibly critical to ensuring the success of a zero emission vehicle regula regulation implementation. This includes obviously the state regulated utility commissions, state transportation agencies, energy offices, commerce agencies that are critical in rolling out funding for workplace charging in incentives and other integrated funding opportunities for housing development. Um, state weights and measures programs provide consumer, consumer protection support similar to, to how they um, inspect and regulate gasoline dispensing. They also are doing the same for electricity dispensing at public um, EV uh, infrastructure locations. And then state health agencies obviously have a stake in um, in these programs, given that they significantly impact states' ability to reduce emissions um, from the transportation sector and impact public health. Next slide, please. So just digging a little deeper into Advanced Clean Cars 2. Um, there's three components of this regulation. There's the regulation itself, which set, sets the ZEV sales requirement stringency. There's ZEV assurance measures, which, which provide a host of more consumer protection oriented components that have to do with warranties, um, the vehicle's useful life and durability, um, the charging uh, cap uh, interoperability and capabilities of the vehicle. And then there's also the uh, low emission vehicle regulation, which we haven't touched on very much, but this is the component of the reg regulation that um, regulates the criteria pollutant emissions from um, the same size motor vehicles, passenger cars, and light duty trucks. Um, and this is the more traditional component of advanced clean cars um, and something that air quality regulators have been implementing for many decades. Um, but as we transition away from internal combustion engine technology in the transportation sector, obviously the zero emission vehicle regulation will be um, more of a focus of this program. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, um, at least 17 states have adopted Advanced Clean Cars 2, um, and we expect there to be more in the coming years. Um, the implementation model year here varies among the two groups of states that have adopted so far because I mentioned that lead time requirement. Um, you can't implement the regulation until two years after you've adopted it. So that means that there is kind of a phase in of the, the regulation. However, whatever implementation model year you jump into, it, you have to match the stringency of the California program within that year to meet the identicality requirements of the Clean Air Act. Next slide, please. So this shows the um, the stringency curve of Advanced Clean Cars 2 for the ZEV component specifically. So manufacturers are required to produce and deliver for sale zero emission vehicles, and they can also meet some of their requirement with plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Um, but as you can see, the stringency of the rule ramps up to 100% by 2035. So again, all new sales of light duty and passenger car vehicles will need to be zero emission vehicles by 2035. Um, and there's a variety of flexibilities that manufacturers can take advantage of to meet these requirements. There's a credit banking trading and averaging program that allows the manufacturer to earn a certain amount of credit value for each vehicle that's delivered. So if they over comply, they can either bank those credits or they can sell them to other automakers participating or required to participate in the program. Um, and there's a host of other compliance flexibilities that the automakers have advocated for over the years that allow them to really tailor their compliance strategy to best meet their business strategy. Next slide, please. Some examples of complementary state policies for accelerating EV adoption in the light duty sector um, include incentive programs that allow um, uh, uh, purchasers of these vehicles to get a point of sale, oftentimes a point of sale discount when they're purchasing the vehicle. So this is on top of the federal tax credit incentive that currently exists um, for many models. Uh, there's charging infrastructure programs, which provide um, grants to businesses, uh, multi-unit dwellings and housing and other public entities to install either level two or direct current fast charging infrastructure to support electric vehicle charging. 
Um, there's utility programs and PUC proceedings um, that, for example, require utilities to develop EV time of use rates to manage loads, um, and then also to support greater customer participation by provo promoting EV um, adoption by um, offering uh, free at-home charging units and things like that. Um, and then also consumer education and dealer support um, allows all aspects of the EV buying um, kind of universe to be educated, for example, uh, vehicle dealers, fleets, and um, other components of the auto industry. Next slide, please. Okay, so digging into advanced clean trucks. So this is also a regulation that, um, that where the, the regulated entity is the auto manufacturer. It is a manufacturer sale, manufacturer sales requirement. It's not a purchase requirement. Um, so it guarantees that there to be a minimum supply of zero emission vehicles in participating states. And it has many of the compliance flexibilities that I mentioned earlier um, as related to the Advanced Clean Cars 2 regulation. Next slide, please. This is just a kind of quick snapshot of the different weight classes that are regulated in advanced clean trucks. And I, I'll explain in a moment why um, kind of each regulatory category is broken up by weight class, but this just gives you a sense of kind of what types of vehicles are affiliated with these class sizes. Next slide, please. Um, so advanced clean trucks, um, there's been 11 states, including California, that have adopted advanced clean trucks to date. Um, and as I said, probably more um, signing on in the coming years. Next slide. And this uh, is the, the sales requirements are a little bit different for advanced clean trucks. And this really takes into account um, the specific vehicle weight class and the applicability of the technology and the status of the technology um, as it relates to what is available in a particular weight class. So as you can see, the, um, the stringency for uh, the lighter classes of vehicles is higher um, given that the, the status of the you know, heavy truck technology in the class seven to eight tractor category um, isn't as advanced as in the lighter categories. Um, so this kind of takes that uh, into account and provides for a, um, you know, a less steep ramp of stringency um, for those, those heavier vehicles. And as you can see, not currently none of the uh, weight class categories reach 100% by 2035. Um, however, California is in the process of amending the advanced clean trucks regulation to be more stringent, um, but how they will um, kind of smooth out the stringency curve um, as, as the stringency is predicted to accelerate beyond 2035 um, remains to be seen. The complementary programs to support um, medium and heavy duty truck adoption are similar to light duty, um, except that um, they just apply to different weight classes of vehicles. And obviously there are different considerations in terms of the electricity demand and supply issues as it relates to charging heavier truck technology with more massive batteries. Um, but there is kind of similar incentive programs and technical advisory assistance to help fleets um, understand the total cost of ownership of these vehicles, which tends to be lower over its useful life than its internal combustion engine uh, comparison model. Um, but as you can see here, a lot of similar programs. Next slide, please. I'm just, I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hopefully that was right on time. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it was uh, really great. I have uh, a lot of a lot of questions there. The ACT, um, the fact that the manufacturers are the regulated entity, like you mentioned, like that's that's a, a big part of you know why I wanted to have this conversation to begin with. Like, how do we actually coordinate between uh, the different regulators? You know, making sure that the uh, that the grid is actually ready to uh, to support um, you know the all of these these additional uh, electric vehicles that are coming online, especially the, the heavy duty electric vehicles that take significant point loads. Um, but we will get into that conversation in the Q&A afterwards. We have one presentation left. Um, we have Peg Hanna from the New Jersey Department 
of environmental protection for our last 15 minute presentation. Uh, Peg Hanna is the director of the Division of Climate Change Mitigation and Moderate Monitoring at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. She develops and oversees economy-wide decarbonization initiatives, advances clean and renewable energy strategies, and oversees operation of the state's ambient air monitoring network. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peg for, uh, for your presentation. We are running a touch behind. So uh, if you could yeah, try I to can, keep us to the 15 can, minutes, sure. that would be great. Yeah, Thank okay. you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I don't think I have too many slides and I tend to talk very quickly anyway. So I think we could probably get through this in less than 10 minutes and maybe get us back on track. Um, so like many other states in the region, especially New Jersey has established many laws, policies and regulations to phase out internal combustion engine vehicles as we try to meet our greenhouse gas reduction goals and our climate mitigation goals. Uh, the chart on the left is just a reminder that for New Jersey, and I think for many other states, the majority of greenhouse gas emissions are coming from our transportation sector. So if we're going to meet our 2050 goals um, and stop all the negative impacts of, or mitigate uh, all of the negative impacts of climate change, we necessarily need to be focusing on the transportation sector. Next slide. Um, so I will admit that when I first started working on transportation decarb, probably 10 years ago, it was really just a DEP thing. Um, we sort of had our eye on the ball and knew that the transportation sector really needed to electrify. Um, and I very naively said uh, when someone asked me, um, well, don't you need to work with BPU? I said, no, I don't need to work with BPU. <laughs> we just do it myself. We just give out a bunch of grants and electrify the sector. Um, I, I quickly came to realize that that was in fact a naive answer and coordination with both our PUC and our utilities are extremely important. Um, and I'm thrilled that we have a really strong and robust uh, relationship amongst all of us, our BPU, um, our utilities and DEP. Um, these are the five areas that I wanted to focus on where we uh, tend to coordinate really well. Next slide. Uh, so first area of coordination, all four utilities in New Jersey are required to have grant programs to fund make ready costs for light duty charging infrastructure. Uh, PSE and G was the first to roll theirs out. Um, the light duty make ready programs are anticipated to fund 1400 fast chargers and 6000 level two. Um, for those of you doing the sort of megawatt kilowatt calculation in your head, that's kind of a lot. And um, that's just for light duty. Um, it was important for us to coordinate with both BPU and the utilities on the implementation of these make ready programs because there was a provision put in that said the utilities can't fund more than 90% of the total project cost. And we allow stacking between the utility programs, BPU programs, and DEP programs. So we had to be in constant conversation, we have to be in constant conversation with the utilities to understand which projects they're funding and make sure that if we are also providing funding, they're not going over the 90% cap. Uh, so one of the ways that we did that is to establish monthly, what I call grant coordination meetings. Those meetings are led by New Jersey DEP. So uh, kind of odd bedfellows, but um, every month, uh, we have our BPU on the call and all four utilities, and there are usually multiple representatives from all of our utilities actively engaged in discussing um, a variety of issues, but particularly <clears throat> how we're going to uh, coordinate on these uh, light duty make ready programs. Next slide. So same is true for medium duty make ready coming soon. Uh, our BPU published a draft framework about a year, maybe a little bit longer ago, um, and that's expected to be finalized this year. So kind of the same uh, general framework as light duty, the utilities will be required to offer grants for make ready for medium and heavy duty. Um, the draft proposal envisions a shared responsibility model. So private investment is prioritized but it also acknowledges that the utilities do have a role in make ready for publicly accessible fleet charging. Um, and then some special provisions for over, overburdened communities. So in the context of these upcoming medium duty make ready programs, um, we shared a couple pieces of information with all of our utilities. 
One of them, was, one of the pieces of information was all of the data that we got in from the fleets as part of our advanced clean truck rule. And that was relevant because it helped the utilities understand the geographic distribution of the fleets that are potentially going to electrify. We also did a GIS map with a couple different data layers, um, including those advanced clean truck fleets that probably um, will be electrifying. We also layered on there some uh, medium and heavy duty charging depots that we knew were underway, overburdened communities, et cetera. So having all of those data layers in one place definitely um, is going to help the utilities develop their uh, make ready programs once our BPU finalizes the framework. Next slide. So second area of coordination, um, BPU and DEP grant programs. So as you can see from this chart, um, we have three state agencies, actually four if you count our DOT, um, that are administering or giving out you know, various types of grants and incentives for EV charging and electric vehicles. Um, we also have various policies and rulemakings and other strategies that are being pushed out by all three of these agencies. So it's really important for um, BPU and DEP particularly to coordinate on all of this. Um, one recent example is EPA issued a notice of funding opportunity for school buses, electric school buses, and EPA was planning to give extra points for applicants that coordinated with their utilities. So in an average day, I don't think the utilities would necessarily have known that that was in this federal grant opportunity. So we flagged it for our utilities. We explained to them um, which applicants might be reaching out to them so that they were prepared on how to respond and get those applicants extra points in that federal application. Uh, next slide. Um, so I'm thrilled that uh, New Jersey DEP was the lead for this winning application, 200 and almost $50 million to do public freight uh, charging at approximately 24 sites throughout these states. That is going to require a tremendous amount of coordination with utilities. Uh, the megawatts that we are projecting from these truck charging depots when fully built out is 484,000 megawatts, not kilowatts. That is an incredible load. Um, there's no way that New Jersey, let alone the other states, are going to do this without uh, working closely with our Board of Public Utilities, Board of Public Utilities and our utilities. Next slide. Uh, third area of coordination is data sharing. Obviously, I don't intend for you to read all of this. Um, so information from the EV charging stations that uh, we are funding is very important, as you all know, to both the utilities and to state agencies. For all of the utilities, it's needed to develop rate structures and demand charge solutions for state agencies like DEP. We want to understand the uptime of the chargers. We want to understand use patterns. Um, and then all of that information will help us develop future incentive programs and justify use of public funds. So both BPU and DEP have negotiated agreements with EBSC providers for the sharing of data. We call them compliant network service providers. Anyone that wants grant money from BPU or DEP must use one of these compliant network service providers. That means that any grant money that we give out for an EV charger, we will get the data from the use of that charger. Um, in fact, our BPU just onboarded or is in the process of onboarding a third party data aggregator that will be able to pull in all of this information that's getting reported from state funded charging stations. Um, and then we can look at it holistically. Next slide. Um, so area of coordination number four. Um, this is a really innovative project and I am um, just so pleased that uh, PSENG is a leader in this area and we expect our other utilities to follow. So as we start funding more and more fast chargers, um, especially through NEVI, capacity becomes more of a concern. Um, also, there were some instances where DEP was trying to install some chargers um, of its own, trying to determine the best location. We had been asking our utility to preliminarily evaluate certain sites. Um, that's not something that the utilities typically do. They don't do like a draft, you know, yeah, we think it's going to be okay or no, it's not going to be okay. 
Um, so we worked, BPU and DEP worked closely with PSE&G and they have launched a pilot red light, green light screening program. Right now it's only applicable to NEVI grantees, but we are hoping that they will expand this. So essentially people are coming in and say, potential site hosts are coming in and saying, I think I wanna put charging stations on the site. There's all of these different factors that are under consideration, but more importantly, I wanna know if there's um, enough capacity at this particular site for the requested load. So PSE&G says, okay, we're gonna have you answer these five questions. So a yes to any one of these questions yields a red light meaning that the site has to go through a full, um, it looks like some of the slide got cut off there, a full detailed evaluation. On the other hand, if you get no for all of these questions, that's meant from a pre-screening purpose, there's a good chance that you could move ahead as is without um, a huge amount of additional costs. So using this pre-screening process, we believe is really going to um, give valuable information to potential site hosts up front and streamline the process and reduce costs. Obviously, if a site host gets uh, comes back with a, a red light, that means costs are gonna be significantly higher. They may choose to develop an alternative location. So it's really providing predictability and transparency in the very beginning of the project um, rather than down the road and then having the uh, site host back out. Uh, next slide which I think is my last slide. Um, so area coordination number five is speaking with one voice. Um, DEP successes or B BPU successes or the utility successes in this space are New Jersey successes. They are not just DEP, they are not just BPU. So we really endeavor to make sure that all of our information is coordinated and all in one place, regardless of which agency is leading the effort. Um, at the end of the day, uh, stakeholders, site hosts, fleets don't really care which agency is giving them the money. They just want the money. So we try to make sure that all of our tools and incentive programs are tailored to the audience. We try to make sure that everyone understands the differences between the different funding opportunities being offered um, by the different state agencies so they can make educated decisions about which one to avail themselves of. Um, last slide, which I think is just closing. Yep, there we go. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, Peg. Really appreciate that. Um, so it's fascinating. Um, I, yeah, I have, I have questions for everybody here, but can we get, um, all three of our presenters back on screen? So, uh, and we'll open this up to Q and A for, uh, for all three at the same time. And you can take the, um, the slides down, uh, for the time being, just so we can, uh, have videos a little bit bigger. But I'm so one one thing that I uh, that I, I just want to start with. So Peg, you you said that the um, I think it was for the public freight fast charging uh, that that was going to be four hundred and eighty four thousand megawatts of new load. Um, that's that's a lot. Um, I can absolutely see why you need to have this coordination across agencies like this. Can you talk? So you you said you said that it's working really well and that, that there's a lot of coordination. How has has it always been that way, or did you have to specifically set it up this way? Was this a new coordination across agencies for New Jersey, or was this something that has al always been there? Because, um, that you know, it, it that's a that's a lot to plan for. Yeah. So that that grant, the two hundred and fifty million dollar one, is brand new. We just learned a few weeks ago, or maybe a month ago now, that we had won it. So the coordination on that is just beginning, but I'd say our coordination with BPU and the utilities just in general on transportation decarb um, is relatively new and very intentional. It did not happen naturally or organically. Um, it was a lot of effort to uh, develop a relationship with my colleagues at BPU and at the utilities and get everybody sort of on the same page, understanding the importance of collaboration and kind of like everybody, you know, put down their silos, put down their defenses, we're all working together. Um, there's no territory here, you know, we can move forward uh, more effectively if we're all coordinating behind the scenes. It was a very uh, resource intensive, but worthwhile relationship building. 
and yeah, very deliberate. It sounds like, which is, yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, okay. That's, that's fascinating. Um, I, yeah, if anybody wants to ask questions, please feel free to, uh, to raise your hand and you can, you can jump in and ask questions of any of the three presenters or feel free to just type them into the chat and I can either read them or, uh, or our, our presenters can, can read them. Um, but until we get some, some hands up, uh, so Zoltan, I, I remember in your presentation, you actually described the demand increase as manageable. Are you seeing demand increases similar to what Peg is seeing through your modeling or were you modeling something different or where is the, where is the, um, the, the disconnect there? Or maybe, maybe 484,000 megawatts is manageable. I, 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 I'm, I guess I'm just not, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm curious where the, um, what, what you're well, modeling is showing. I, I, I should have qualify my earlier statement of, I believe we were looking primarily at the light and medium duty vehicle fleet. Okay. And uh, we did not take trucks into consideration, although I'd have to review all that as well. Honestly, I kind of missed some of the earlier talk as well. So I cannot uh, quite explain what the differences are, uh, but uh, they were still very interesting talks. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, that's, that's <laughs> Sorry. helpful. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, that, that's just something I feel like I, I get all kinds of different, uh, d different uh, projections, no matter what, um, d d it, different projections, depending on who you talk to, right? And and there's different models and, uh, and, and different assumptions that go into uh, all of this. And, you know, honestly, like, that's something that makes our job as regulators for the electric industry particularly difficult is that we need to try to plan for the future and plan for what the future of the load is going to look like and where that load is going to come on and then approve investments for the utilities based on those projections. And when you have like these these very, uh, very differing projections, it makes it quite difficult, which has been a, a, a topic that we talk about a lot at the um, at the EV State Working Group. Um, I would love to uh, to dig a little bit more into the uh, the ACT though, and the fact that the manufacturers are the regulated entity there. Um, that was that was actually the 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 impetus for <laughs> for this whole thing today was that I I was I was just fascinated at how this is all going to have to work together, right? Like that the if it's the the manufacturers of these vehicles are need to produce um, a certain number of or percentage of their zero uh, uh, their um zero emissions vehicles requirement um the the grid has to be there to be able to power those trucks uh you know we have to make sure that they're if if they're coming on they they have to be sold um you know we we need to make sure that that we're prepared so I guess, how, what are the states? Uh, I think you mentioned there were either 17 or 11. I think I, I lost track of which, which, uh, which number for which of the, um, if it was a ACC or ACT. Uh, which, what states who have implemented the, the ACT in particular, because you know that's the heavier duty will have a bigger grid impact. The states who have implemented that, and I think New Jersey is one of them. Um, what exactly are you, uh, like the details of what you're doing to prepare. I understand like the, the communication and the coordination super necessary, but um, can you talk a little bit more about the the details of what you're doing to prepare? Um, maybe start with Megan on, on that one and then Peg, you can go into details on New Jersey. Sure, so as I mentioned, it's, it's really a, a whole of government approach to implement both of these regulations um, for light duty and medium and heavy duty. Um, and this is, as, as Peg mentioned in the beginning of her presentation, you know, this is different for air quality regulators, which is why we were really excited to come and talk to this group as well, because traditionally mobile source practitioners have dealt um, with criteria pollutant standards um, and have been, you know, dealing with standards relevant to internal combustion engines. And so the, the need to coordinate beyond the environmental agency was really limited up until, you know, the, the increase in stringency of the zero emission vehicle regulations. And so it really does require close coordination with all of the entities that I mentioned earlier, and especially from an infrastructure perspective. 
um, there's there's a lot of of barriers um, or challenges associated with deploying EV charging infrastructure, especially for heavy trucks. I mean, the lead time on these projects is definitely multiple years, and um, I think that there is a lot of federal and state funding right now and private investment that is being put towards electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So the funding is definitely there, um, at least for the, 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 the state that the industry is in right now. Um, so I, I, there's just, yeah, there, there's a lot of coordination that, um, that needs to happen and especially cord close coordination with utility regulators in particular, um, to ensure that the, you know, amount of charging that's being deployed is being deployed, um, responsibly. And I, I will mention one, um, kind of design component of the advanced clean truck regulation that I think is um, uh, meant to specifically address the kind of reality of the, the state of the infrastructure deployment is that the, the level of stringency for the type of vehicles that are more um, uh, likely to have a duty cycle wherein they kind of complete their, their daily trip without having to charge midday, but can go back to their truck depot or wherever they're housed and charge overnight more slowly, like on a level two charger, um, matches that kind of ramp up in stringency. So ACT kind of requires that those types of vehicles with that duty cycle where they're really just charging at night more slowly um, are, are um, brought online uh, before the trucks that their duty cycle would require them to charge either, you know, once or multiple times during the day. And so I think that's important to understand that these regulations have been really designed with that type of feasibility and applicability in mind. And I think that's important for everyone to, to, to understand because it, it, it really does favor earlier that type of um you know slower more easy more easily managed charging so that's one component of the regulatory design that i think is um you know and important for this conversation definitely yeah that's great that's really helpful um peg anything to add um i just say this is definitely an interesting regulation because there are from a compliance perspective, there are at least two things that are outside of the regulated entity's control, and that is the charging infrastructure, and then uh, they're relying on the dealers, the you know fleets, to actually buy the trucks. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting about this is there is really a strength in numbers. So to the extent that more and more states um, adopt this regulation, we're now sending a signal to the market that as a region, this is what we want. And I think that eventually is going to um, give us a better return on investment. That's great, thanks. Still not seeing any hands up. If anybody wants to chime in and ask questions, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to. Um, but if not, uh, I will ask one more question and then we'll go to our uh, the closed session. Um, do, so I live in uh, auto industry land. Uh, most of my friends and family work for auto manufacturers. I hear all of the, um, uh, the uh, different, headlines um, are much louder uh, here uh, in the Detroit area about the, the future of the auto industry. And, you know, a few years ago, it was all in on EVs. And um, as of the last month or two, it's all out on full EVs. Uh, everybody now is talking about hybrids. Um, and, there, and everybody is, uh, you know, talking about the fact that the automakers are uh, going back on some of these um, uh, promises to offer only ele all electric vehicles by a certain date um, and are reducing their projections for how many electric vehicles are going to be produced, all electric vehicles. There's a lot, a lot more hybrids. Um, but for the, the full electric vehicles, numbers are, our projections are much, much lower. 
um, as of late. Um, are many, so, but because of these regulations in these states, it seems that the, those manufacturers are still required to offer these uh, these full electric options. Um, are manufacturers still on track? Uh, to uh, to meet these the the um, the ACC and ACT. I, I I'm going to be realistic. I think it's too soon to tell. I think the you know the early stages, um, the first couple years of the program, they'll have enough flexibilities and sort of you know banked credits from over complying that they'll be fine. Um, whether they can meet the ultimate goals at the end, you know, 20 to 35, I guess it is. Um, I think it's too soon to tell. I don't know, I, Maggie, I, do you have rose colored glasses? I, I mean, no, I definitely agree with you, Peggy. I think it's too soon to tell. I mean, we can look at the data that, you know, we analyze quarterly in terms of ZEV sales across the participating jurisdictions um, in the rules. And um, I mean, we do continue to see increases in sales year over year comparing quarters. Um, you know, there's some automakers that are starting to fall behind. Like some of the news about Tesla earlier this year was mostly a result of the fact that other automakers were kind of stepping into the ZEV market more seriously. And so other, you know, people who were interested in buying EVs were buying those cars instead of Teslas. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what was happening there, I think. Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Peg, but I think we do still see growth and um, we, I, I think the automakers will be able to um, achieve compliance with the new generation of the regulation, as Peg mentioned, because of all the flexibilities that are built into the rule. Um, so that should give them a pretty soft landing pad um, for the, you know, entering into the, the new phase of the regulation. Fantastic. Well, thanks. Thanks to uh, to all three of you for your presentations today. I really appreciate you taking the time to come talk to this group of uh, energy regulators. And uh, you know, it looks like we've got a lot of uh, a lot of coordination work to do to um, to prepare for this. So, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to come talk with us and um, and and give us your perspectives. Uh, so, at this so, virtual round of applause. Um, so at this point, we'll uh, we'll ask everybody, all of the non-state uh, utility commission uh, commissioners and commission staff to drop off, and uh, we'll go into our our closed session. Thank you. Thanks very much. Take care. Thank you.